Movies, books, and TV shows paint fairly gruesome pictures of a zombie plague, but they're usually vague about precisely how the epidemic begins. Today, I want to discuss a potential backstory that's less ridiculous than it sounds. Could a zombie apocalypse start with a routine trip to space? In some stories, zombies are slow. In others, they're fast. But most fictional zombie universes share two basic features. You're gonna need a weapon, and the zombie phenomenon starts unexpectedly and spreads quickly, which is why it wreaks so much havoc. Now, the underlying zombification mechanism varies from story to story, but often it's envisioned as an infectious disease, hence the abrupt onset and rapid spread. The disease vision of zombie apocalypse has so much in common with real-world epidemics that the CDC actually developed a zombie outbreak preparedness plan, and the Pentagon had a zombie outbreak training exercise. In fact, non-joking textbooks and academic papers have been written with detailed mathematical and computer models of how a zombie epidemic would spread. By the way, for maximum survival, you want to go to Montana or Wyoming. See the link in the description. Unlike other government agencies, NASA still hasn't gotten on the zombie train. But maybe they should. Because one scenario that's more plausible than you might think is that a zombie apocalypse could start in space. It may not be obvious, but space flight introduces some unique wrinkles into how infectious diseases might originate and spread. Let's start with bacteria. In 2006, researchers sent some salmonella on the space shuttle, brought it back down to Earth, and then infected mice with it. 90% of them died, compared to just 60% from regular salmonella. The lethal dose of salmonella also dropped to just one-third its usual level. More infectious bacteria flown on subsequent shuttle missions showed similar changes. What's weird is that the salmonella didn't mutate. Instead, many of its genes just became overexpressed, including ones that make it more virulent. Bottom line, a few days of space flight can make certain bacteria significantly deadlier. Now I know, a lot of fiction says zombieism is viral and not bacterial. First of all, lots of plagues throughout history have been bacterial, but okay, viruses. Consider The Walking Dead. In that world, every living person has somehow already contracted the zombie virus, which lies dormant until you die, at which point where the virus came from and how everyone got infected, though, have yet to be explained. So consider this. Preliminary evidence suggests that the 3D structure of viral proteins, which dictates in part how viruses enter cells, may be altered in microgravity. Moreover, blood samples taken from astronauts during various stages of spaceflight show reactivation of dormant viruses that they already carry, like chickenpox or the Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono, all of which suggests that viruses also are more virulent in orbit. Now, this could be happening due to changes in the viruses themselves, or because spaceflight generally weakens the human immune system, or both. NASA's not really sure yet. All I'm saying is, given what we do know, it sounds like patient zero on The Walking Dead could have been an astronaut carrying a distorted virus. Now, zombies aside, NASA and other space agencies research infectious disease extensively. But that research is tricky because you need to put people in space for long periods to collect data, and that takes years. NASA also has thorough quarantine and sterilization procedures to minimize germs hitchhiking into orbit, but you can never really get stray microbes down to zero. Take the Curiosity rover, for instance. To avoid contamination of the Martian surface, NASA went to great lengths to sterilize the rover before launch. Clean rooms, people in bunny suits, the works. But Curiosity was still estimated to harbor a few hundred thousand microbes when it took off. Considering you have trillions of foreign bacteria on or in you right now, a few hundred thousand is tiny, but it's not zero. Plus, the future of space travel won't just be government space agencies. If you fast forward a few decades, you're gonna have an era of space tourism or space hotels where ordinary people are taking vacations to low Earth orbit. Once most space passengers aren't professional astronauts anymore, you're gonna have a pretty big petri dish up there with lots of opportunities for a hypothetical zombie patient zero. Because the bottom line is that infectious disease takes on a whole new dimension in space. And dealing with that fact is one of the biggest challenges in establishing a larger human presence in Earth orbit and beyond. So to recap, space flight can strengthen and change the operation of pathogens. It weakens the body's immune response. And 100% sterilization is impossible, even in the cleanest of NASA clean rooms. Sound like a plausible plot device for how a fictional, previously unknown disease gets a foothold? Since our understanding of the nuances of disease in space is still in its infancy, it's not like anyone's in a position to say it's impossible. I mean, other than the reanimation part, but why split hairs? So, what do you guys think? Will the zombie apocalypse start in space? Should Fear of the Walking Dead feature space flight in its upcoming origin story for the Walking Dead zombie virus? Let us know in the comments, along with any cool scenarios you might have in mind for a good space-based zombie apocalypse backstory. I'll report the best ones on the next episode of Space Time. Last week's episode was about farting your way to the moon. You guys had a lot to say in the comments. At the top, let me just address all the comments about our choice of topic for this episode. Look, this was all me. I think farts are funny and that they're a good vehicle for explaining physics. I also went to school for more than 10 years, published articles in journals, I like the ballet, go figure. So let's look at some of the physics questions that this episode prompted. Jarmid Balfi asked, if I kept releasing gas over several days, wouldn't eventually I pick up a lot of speed? In short, no. 
The effects when you're releasing that little mass are basically additive and they come out from just straight up momentum conservation. Even if you released a full day's worth of gas every day for a year, you would still only build up to a few millimeters per second of speed, just not very fast. Now, say you wanted to release decades or something worth of gas. At that point, the total amount of gas that you would have released would have been a non-trivial fraction of your body mass, and to compute everything correctly, you would have had to take that loss of mass into account and use a more correct version of momentum conservation called the rocket equation that compensates for this. Dario Dario alluded to the rocket equation in that form of, comp of calculating momentum conservation in his comment. Tony Falca asked, could you not swim through space? There were a lot of responses indicating no, because there's nothing to push against, the same way that they're, you're pushing against water on Earth. However, David Shi made a comment directing me to a paper by an MIT physicist indicating that in a curved space-time, you may actually be able to do this, actually have reactionless propellant. I'm gonna read up on this and make sure that I understand it right, but this could be fodder for another episode. And finally, Remy Porter commented that he'd love to see his farts accelerate to Mach 4. You and me both, brother. You and me both. And remember, rule number one for the zombie apocalypse, cardio.